everyone. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Blair Sinta. This is Recording Drums. Today I'm talking to Nashville session man Jerry Rowe. Jerry uh, has a deep Nashville session history throughout his family. Um, he's working a ton these days as an amazing drummer, uh, but his main focus is on his, um, you know, hard rock metal. Uh, I hate to classify it one way or the other. Um, group uh, he has with his wife, and it's called Friendship Commanders. Uh, it's really cool. Um, I definitely recommend checking it out um, if 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 you if you go down that lane listening. Uh, sonically, this it's just great. Songs are cool. Sounds great. It's raw. I like it. Um, all right, everybody, courses are for sale. Um, I'm going to put a sale up this weekend, 15% off. Uh, so if you're interested in any of my courses, please head to my website, BlairSinta.com. Um, there will be a coupon code at checkout, 15% off any of the courses. Uh, improve Your Groove, The Snare Sound Bible, and uh, what's the last one? Oh, Recording Drums, right. Uh, all right, everybody, have a good week. Uh, enjoy my conversation with Jerry Rowe. He's a fun character. All right. See ya. What's up, dude? I like the RE20. Oh, yeah. It's about all I had that was a dynamic that wasn't really being used. So I just got a 421 there, I see. Is that right? It, you know, we're rolling old school, man. That's how we do. That's what I should be using. My 421's not on anything. Yeah, I know. I have two of them, and w this one sits here. And then, actually, I use one for kick drum sometimes now, which is kind of fun. I did that for a minute. I, I'm on the D12 now, the VR, not the old one. Yeah. Man, we are right into it. I love it. <laughs> your favorite uh, high-end frequency to boost? <laughs> or do you just let the uh, mix engineer handle that? Uh, 3K, somewhere around 3. Yeah, 3.52. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. How about yours? It's like a logic frequency. Do you have like a um? Do you have like a friendship commander's frequency that you like over like you know, other things? Uh, no, you know, actually, I, I ran the kick pretty flat on our last batch of stuff because Kurt mixes. I don't really want to push him in either direction. Okay, Kurt. Blue. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, man? <laughs> Yeah, it's been a long time. I know. I know, man. Okay? What's that? You doing okay? I'm doing okay. You? Yeah, I mean things are good here. Cool. How is, long have you been how long have you been back there? I moved back in fits and starts across 2012. Okay. So I I properly I no longer lived in Los Angeles by October of that year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you were here for like five years more? Just three. Maybe a little over. Three? Yeah. Okay. I feel like I saw you enough that like, <laughs> like, you know. Well, you know, I, I saw you a few times before then. I was in town a lot, spent time there. Right. What was your general take on LA? Because you, you grew up in Nashville, right? Yeah. Um, You know, I loved it. Uh, I was getting what I wanted out of living there. I also understand I lived there while it was peaking to an extent. Uh, like two, 2010 was pretty awesome. Yeah. As far as the local music scene goes. So right. I, I, I got lucky when I was there. I don't know what it's like now, but I had a great time. Yeah. Um, I mean, for definitely for me playing out around town, you know, somewhere be between like 2007 and 2010-ish, I played a lot. And the whole, the whole hotel cafe scene was different than it is now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there was a, yeah, there was a lot of like, I just feel like generationally, you know, for, for, for me and stuff, it was, that was definitely a hot point. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot to like back then anyway. Yeah. Um, but you know, outside of just the weather and the culture, location, right. food. Right. All that. Right. So were you working in as much in Nashville before you kind of spent some time here as you do now? Not in the way that I am now. Um, it was like primarily touring and weird, like independent sessions in the like Americana world. All right. Okay. That kind of thing. I'd always done a little bit. Ironically, my first 
uh, major country master session was in LA after I moved there. Okay. So I, like uh, moved, I moved to LA to kind of try and escape that and work more <laughs> in the rock music and other things. And then, yeah, that happened. Right. Um, but it was better. I mean, I mean, you, you work a shitload from what I can yeah. tell. I mean, <laughs> so it's like, you were like, fuck it. Like I'm, I'm going to go work and I'll figure it out. Right. Man, you know, dude, I, I came back and um, the group of guys that I knew from road gigs and just growing up playing in bars, it kind of started to take over when I came back. And so they were just like, hey, here's this work. And right. it snowballed from there. Right. Right. I didn't have quite the, the fast ascension that a lot of them maybe did because, you know, like you discussed the A-list situation here is like a changing of hands and like who's working over who and so i can i kind of kept touring and i've you know i have a loud mouth and i don't i have my opinion so uh, it took me no longer i think <laughs> well whatever whatever works man it seemed yeah. to work you know i also just realized i referred to myself indirectly as an a-lister which is kind of a chodish thing to do <laughs> it is true at this point so i mean whatever Ch- chodish chodish I don't yes. know that term. Well, I think it's probably in the dictionary now. Okay. I'll look it up. <laughs> I might put it next to it. I like it. So, all right. So how much are you recording at home versus like, I feel like, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm talking about like Instagram, right? Seeing like shit. Like, I feel like you're, well, did you already work this morning? Uh, I- no, actually, my car is in the shop. Ah, well, that is work, but a different type of work. It is work. Uh, but no, I would have probably, who knows? (laughs) Cool. (laughs) I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's primarily studio work. Yeah. Uh, I have a home rig. I use it somewhat regularly, but right. Mostly here. If you're working here, you're doing that. Right. And is it, are you mainly doing modern country stuff or is it all over the map? Is it like real, is it more organic stuff or, I mean, cause I mean, the, one of the cooler things I think about you is that you know you can go do the train beat thing but then you can do friendship commanders like and that sounds pretty fucking authentic you know what i mean yeah well thank you um you you know i so i did more of the organic americana situation a lot more like alternative independent stuff before i moved that um that used to be more open culture but it's kind of gotten a little more divided as more people have moved here so i feel like i'm I've ended up pretty firmly in the modern country camp, but I still dip my toe in the other side as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, those those folks tend to just use their band guys, their road guys. Okay. And uh, also those sessions don't pay well. So you get kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place with like what to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's unfortunate, you know, so it really like you can, you can value one session or the other if you know the person or you have experience with their music, but otherwise going in blind. Right. It's a little weird. I'd, I, you know, a lot of times I'd rather do that kind of stuff, but it is what it is. Just, just like musically. Yeah. 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 Do you find like the cookie? Uh, well, I'm good. Uh, let me try it. Let me start over that. I should, I just fucking stuck my foot in my mouth, but that's fine. I prefer that. Do you find that like, the modern country thing is a little more cookie cutter. That's a better way to fucking phrase it. All right. <laughs> or do you feel like you get to kind of bring some of you to like, you're, you're getting hired to bring some of you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is both that and not that. I mean, it really just depends on who you're working with. Right. Uh, not depends on the me. producer or the yeah, Like, you know, to remove some some of the uh, vague undertones there. Like working with a Dan Huff is going to be a pretty great experience. Um, he's good at getting what he wants and getting to the point, but while also still letting it be your idea. Mm-hmm. And some of the more emotional experiences I've had playing music in studio has been on stuff he's produced lately. So, is that because it's a, a, a live tracking situation or what? I uh, just he fosters the environment for it. You know, it's always live tracking here. It's it's rare that you're just the only person in the room. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's just fucking awesome. Did you 
Okay, so did you? How much did you record while you were out here? You know, uh, it was. I feel like it was a fair amount. It was a lot of more independent stuff. Like I worked with old Clay Blair a lot, mm-hmm. and in Justin Glasgow, my my pals there in the hotel cafe scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a lot of playing with two or three people a night at hotel cafe, though. That was a lot of my time. Right. Right. And that is a skill set unto itself to remember all those songs. Yeah. I mean, that was similar to when I was, I mean, we were obviously weren't, we weren't, well, I guess we were there on similar nights. Yeah. But yeah. That was also like, you know, three different artists a week, 12 songs for each artist and yeah. try, trying to do justice to what was on the record or. Yeah. And then it would, it would all combine to where you're playing with three different people in one night and right. you have like a, a pile of charts and you're like, who's wait. Yeah. You're just looking at tempos and you're like, great. No. Yeah. What, what's the first part of the song? What's the groove? Who are you? Right. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a skill set of like, okay, what, okay. What's the, fe- how do I count this song off? Even though I, I know I know it, but I kind of don't know it. <laughs> well, I just always imagine if there was a way to slow down, you hit the downbeat, not really remembering exactly what the feel of the song is, but having a basic idea. And then the guitar player starts going and you're like, that's it. And then you can go like, if you could bullet time that somehow right, to sort of adjust as you went. Yeah. I think there were some awkward beginnings of songs. So it's a horrible feeling to not know what the feel is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or a bridge or what's, I know there's a bridge coming. I don't yeah. know what that is. Yeah. There's like a Vince Gill saying, it's like, we didn't, I'm not getting paid enough and I didn't have enough time to prepare. So all you're getting is the middle. You can't count on starting and ending good. <laughs> yeah. He actually admitted that out loud. <laughs> well, it's like, it, it, like a, it was uh it was at some like night that we were all playing. Like it was like a benefit. We just showed up and he was like, uh, calling songs off the top of his head. Okay. So extend the solos. Everybody will forget the bad ending. Right. Um. So, so, but the but the live tr- well what do I say let let's say the bigger studio thing in L A was you weren't doing as much no no yeah. right um, even the the live band tracking I did was at a smaller scale and it was weird projects yeah like independent film scores and stuff right so what was the what was the thing that like turned it when you moved back for for was it just like the right time with peers or, or what for when you got back and all of a sudden things kind of went? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, I, I mean, I had a history here and my family's here. So when there was like sort of a built in work flow right. when I landed, but right. But yeah, a lot of, a lot of my friends and peers were, were doing it and happy to give me work and happy to see me back. So it just kind of all lined up. Well, right. It was like the right time. Mm-hmm. Do you think it, that would have happened had you not left? Yeah, it yeah. would have happened a little sooner. Okay, maybe. Um, but yeah, is that what you wanted to do? Like, was that always like a goal to be like, you know, a list yeah. session guy? I said it because you said it. Yeah. <laughs> Showdish a list session guy. Uh, no, I mean, to an extent, it's what I was raised for just growing up here, you end up so familiar with it that it's always something that you would likely do if you end up in the right place, right time, Mm -hmm. never. But I was always just, I wanted to be in a band. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I tried. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You know, with my loud mouth, there's a guitar player here in town who I won't name, who was like, well, you know, I don't really think anybody at a young age is like, I can't wait to grow up to play on popular country music. <laughs> and so that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah. Your goal is to be somewhat of a rock star. Maybe that's not even the right term. Yeah. Being a fucking popular band. Right. Yeah. It's like, whether or not you decide to cut that out because it might be bad for my career. Who knows? I don't know. That's you. You tell me. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't take that as bad, but you know, yeah. Unless, unless that person knows. I, I think we just leave all of the awkward shit in personally. So Yeah, definitely. <laughs> better that way. Exactly. Um uh 
It's you know it's 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 funny because um I remember Fred Altringham lived out here in the early late nineties early two thousands, yeah. and I haven't talked to Fred in a very long time. Um, but you know from what I knew is that he was kind of like like it just wasn't happening for him as much as here as he kind of thought it should be. I, I don't, and I don't want to like put words in his mouth because that may be fucked up. But I mean that is not the case now. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. He went to Nashville and now he's like I think he moved here at the right time. There was sort of a you know the 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 music that happened here in the aughts was so directly descended from the nineties, which in a lot of ways was still really connected to the the older era, eras of music. It was kind of like awkward family Christian uh, middle of the road. And, you know, they like Keith Urban showed up and a lot of like stuff sort of blew it into a more pop spectrum. But mm-hmm. I think, but when Fred moved here it was, it was, it was ripe for a, a more like old school, like seventies concept kind of brought it back to the old stuff. And mm-hmm. he was the right place, right time. It was perfect timing. He yeah. actually, the minute he landed in town, he took over on the road gig I was on. And uh, it was the With records. So. Oh, the records. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Was Michelle living out in uh, Nashville at that time? No, not yet. Okay. She moved here uh, soon after. Okay. Oh, she's there now? Yeah. Okay. I saw her out here. Wow, that was, that's interesting. I saw her. Man, it, actually, it might have, that might have been. Was she here when you were here? No, actually, I think she already relocated here. I might be oh. wrong. She had a. She always had like a condo. And okay. I remember she still had the big house out there when when I was doing the gig. But okay, I kind of think the plan was always to come this way. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Fred, it, Fred and I have like swapped gigs a few times. Played on a lot of the same records. Played. We often get lumped in together. Which is funny. I don't really think we play similar at all, but. Maybe it's just like similar taste. I have no idea, but Miles McPherson paid you a high compliment. I talked to him like a few weeks ago and he said, you play like more on the click than anybody that he knows. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Thank you, Miles. Yeah. And, and for, for like what he, and, and that came up because he was talking about like, you know, when he does shit at home, he just beat detectives. He's like, that's, that's just Nashville style. He just does it. Doesn't think twice. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I don't, I don't do that. Mm-hmm. It ends up happening later. I probably could save some people some work mm-hmm. if I did, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's less the style now. I, I think I know like Dan's not really, he's trying to pocket stuff to the drummer as much as okay. possible rather than pocketing the drummer. So you oh there, you think there's a shift happening? People are trying to like get away from it and have it feel. Yeah, I mean with the microcosms in the genre, like there are people who always do it a certain way. But sure, sure, sure. But you feel like the stuff you're involved in is a little more maybe heading that way. Yeah, yeah. there's less electronics too, so there's less of a need directly. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of programming in country music for a while, and that's kind of that's diminishing, if not going away entirely. Interesting. Yeah. Is that, do you feel like that shift is like in the past six months to a year or what do you, you know, like, is that, do you feel like that has hit the commercial market yet or? Yeah, it's been slow going over a couple of years. Okay. Um, I think if you were to like scroll through a playlist of it, you'd still hear some trap hats, but a lot of it would be gone. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you you're, know, like, you're letting your trap hat skills go. Is that what I am. I am. I used to have to program loops in machine, like on demos. And most of the time you're not doing that anymore. Okay. Yeah. Before a session, you were doing that. You just do it on the fly. Okay. Like quick one minute, two bar loop program, email it to the engineer. It handles the first first read on second course uh, on the first course. Right. Yeah. Uh, so how much how much of this stuff? Tell me about your home setup and how much and like what you're doing out there mostly. Are you mostly using it for your personal stuff or is it? Uh, well, you know, we recorded uh, all the French New Commander stuff that we've done from like all the stuff that's come out since since 2020 to now was recorded here. Mm-hmm. Um, we did our new LP up in Salem, Massachusetts, with Kurt Blue. Okay. Uh, 
and you know he's he's in converge he's got his own studio god city okay um so i'm doing a lot of tracks here but it's like five percent that might even be generous of what i'm doing oh wow okay uh mostly due to schedule i it's five days a week for the most part so i'm either tracking on weekends which i try to not do just so i can yeah have a life or just cramming it in at the end of the day and i don't really want to do that um so but, it's almost, it's almost not what what's the word I should say um it's like nice that you have it but you almost don't need it right I'm I bought all the gear I have so we could record our own stuff that's what it was primarily for I've always right. recorded okay. I've always wanted a nice setup okay um but you know in like the first half of the shutdown it became really valuable to have yeah but even like one month into the shutdown. I was back in a studio end of April, 2020. Wow. Really? With like, yeah. that was even before testing, like they had great testing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, we're in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And you know, it's like, it wasn't really so much a choice. It was like, right. Here we go. This is yeah. it. People were like, we're, we're working like, screw it. We're going to work. Yeah. And I mean, just right down to being in a red state, like, the studios didn't really have safety nets. It was like, we work or we're losing it. So what was that like? Like personally, pretty bad. Uh, you know, I was super cautious, all the musicians, especially. Um, so there, uh, this will be a long winded answer. Okay. There, we're in a purple dot in the middle of a very red state. It's supposed to be blue, but it's pretty purple. Um, almost all of our musicians are, generally to the left on things just you know we're musicians tacos there are those of us who are not even then socially tend to be more on the left side uh so there was kind of a strange like the musicians were really concerned songwriters country singers weren't um and that was pretty much it so it was pretty testy for a while it, you know we had it set up to where players would be far away from each other as knowledge, you know, changed, things would change. But for the most part, we'd be wearing masks, just sit down in our seats, not get up. They'd play the song for us. We'd, somebody write a chart and get copied. We'd never get up, you know, okay. go outside as much as possible. Miraculously, almost none of us caught it. Right. Through the thing. Okay. And then, uh, so there was no, the, the, any, any, any listening back was just back through your headphones with the mix that yeah. you had. And yeah. Is you know with the way studios are set up, it wasn't really an ideal space for spreading. Right, you'd have, you'd have a small amount of people in each room, or some people have their own booths. Right, and with a mask it, on, yeah, 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 it worked out. Yeah, um, and then you know vaccines happen, and then just as per Tennessee, everything pretty much relaxed, and it never really went back to that ever again. But right, okay, right. We've been acting as if it was normal since last May. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it left a year ago in Tennessee. Yeah, it's gone. It's over. <laughs> um, tell me about like your your kind of your like your like love for like metal and like how that like either informs or you try to keep that separate from you know playing modern country or or like organic country or or folk or you know what I mean like no man you know uh. What's strange is I really thought, you know, in the in the two thousands especially, like like metal and hard rock drumming was really like it was it had found its way into country music. Mm-hmm. And whether you liked it or not, and I was like, Yeah, man, that's that I guess that'll be the thing I get called for. And it, it wasn't for a long time. It was like vibey, mid tempo, songwriter groove stuff. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, you know, I've never really tried to steer it a certain way or separate the two. Mm-hmm. Um I think you just, you know, you've, you've played for a lot of different artists. You kind of become aware of the artist's brand for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. like what's acceptable and what's not. Right. Um, unless they want you to go in a certain direction. And even then usually we're like, are you sure? And then go as far as we think is right. reasonable. Right. And they're like, often they're like, Oh, that's too much. What are you doing? And then, you know, so. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, no, that, yeah, no, I mean, I kind of expect that answer because it's a similar thing. Like I love hitting the drums hard, but like, I don't hit them that hard anymore, you know? Yeah. 
And then there are I, certain situations where I, I'm like, oh, cool, I can turn it on. Right. Yeah. I, I think there are, in a lot of ways, there are two types of musicians who just like to play what they're playing no matter what. They or they want to play a track for the song and they're most inspired by songs. Yeah. And I think I'm more of a song guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm not just going to be metal dude all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's worked out for me lately. It's been a lot of what I've, I've been doing, like on the hardy stuff. It's real medley, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it came early. My dad made sure I was listening to, to metal stuff when I was a kid. He was like, these are the real drummers. They're really fucking playing. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Who are your favorites? Uh, well, Vinnie Paul. Yeah. Um, probably my overall favorite, um, just from like a groove perspective and everything. I did love Lars when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, less said about Enough that. Said. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, you know, uh, like Bill Bruford's an all-time fave. Like I played along to Red more than anything when I was a kid. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Close to the Edge, so... Not that he's a metal drummer, but it's not for him. Right. Do you feel like the Vinnie Paul thing sonically, like, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's like his thing is so outlandish in a, in, a, in an awesome way, you know? Right. It really paved the way for modern yeah. metal drum sounds. Yeah. I mean, I still reference that. I'm like, I'm like, you mean like that Pantera sound? Not that I'm ever really right. ever asked to get that but i'm like you mean that thing like that's like the harshest craziest fucking weirdest drum sound ever yeah that was the original i feel like every other kick drum sound before then was still some degree of normal <laughs> right <laughs> that's just an ambassador with no front head and a bunch of blankets right that right. makes sense but you're right. like what the hell was that yeah so and i do know was it a silver dollar duct tape to a power stroke three Okay. With uh, 414 on figure eight in the middle of the kick drum. No shit. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, bam. You just dropped some gold, dude. Uh, Far Beyond Driven was recorded here. So I feel like uh, somebody who was there told me that. Here meaning in Nashville? Yeah. Okay. Jer- Jerry Abbott owned Abtrex, which was a studio in Berry Hill, and that's where it was tracked. Wow. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting. I'll have to try that because that is not, that's not what I would have thought. You know what I mean? Especially that subby thing. Like, what? Yeah. Like, where did the sub part come from? I guess maybe that was just EQ. Yeah. I don't think there were samples yet. Maybe snare, but not the kick. Yeah, because now a lot of that stuff is triggering and getting yeah. that ticky ticky thing. Because, man, playing on a quarter or a silver dollar is a f- pain in the ass. Yeah. Do you it do was, that? Do you do that for friendship? No, no. Okay. I like to keep it reasonable. <laughs> a wood beater on a on a quarter. I used, there was a, there's an engineer. I actually just worked with him again recently, but I used to work with him a lot more like ten years ago. Where I, just for pop stuff, he would always have me do that. Yeah. Quarter. Wow. Quarter. Yeah. Never done it. Never. No. Try it. <laughs> I've done the red Danmar beaters. I've enjoyed the red, the yeah. red Danmars. Okay. Using the Vic first these days, those like weirdly shaped felt ones. Yeah. Like the square, teardrop, square like, one? teardrop shaped kind of. Oh yeah. That's a thing now. That shape. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up liking the weight that, that on the DW machine chain drive works pretty well. Okay. Did you ever meet Vinnie Paul? Once it, um, <laughs> I played Download Festival the first year that it was Download Festival in Castle Donington with, uh, with Hit Automatica. Okay. Oh, okay. So wait. Were, so were you in metal bands primarily as a kid until a certain age? Like, was that the thing? Was that the path you were kind of? Well, I was through, to head I down? only ever actually in one, which was my first one, which only ever played Metallica covers in our garage. Okay, we played like one pri- one party for private school. Okay, and funny enough, it was with Grady Martin's son, Josh Martin. You know the Nashville guitar player, Grady. I don't um, actually, but okay. Uh, we'll look him up. He played on El Paso, Marty Robbins. Um, but uh, yeah, we never really played a gig. Um, my band after that was with 
David Hungate's son. Okay. To, it was very like piano power pop. Okay. Then I was in a Screamo band. It, well, it you know that band started out as kind of a new metal band. It was like active rock, new metal at the time. Then we switched to like indies. Screamo got signed, did that, and then I joined Hit Automatica, which was uh, very like power pop with a guy from a post hardcore band. Okay. So, so he could scream. He could, but um, yeah, the story behind Download Festival that year was that it was the first year it wasn't just a metal festival and they were having like regular bands play and they had to put like a net in, on the stage in front of Mike and Romance so they wouldn't get hit with stuff. Oh, wow. People were unhappy because they played after Slayer. Not good. No, that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At a metal, festi- metal festival. Wow. So. So, so the friendship commanders thing is is like, well, obviously, you know, it's you know, you and your wife, but like, it's like, is it kind of a a, a just a musical creative separate release from everyday work, or what's, you know what I mean? Like, what's the? Ah, uh, well, you know, um, it is. I consider it my life's work at this point. It's okay. The thing I love the most. Um, we most of our year would be spent touring and then working on new music until the pandemic hit. Um, so the last couple of years were pretty tough in that way. Um, we did go back out on the road in the last year and, uh, you know, we're sort of reconfiguring to hit the road again with this new record, which hopefully we'll be touring a lot on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like the thing I mean most on planet earth. And it's kind of weirdly, uh, I say weirdly because I'm not really the songwriter. All the songs are written by Buick. Mm. It's exactly me musically. Like all my weird mashup of stuff gets in there. Okay. It's like metal, but with a more organic, naturally felt approach. Mm. No, no clicks, no editing anywhere. Uh, it's also really songy and melodic and you know, hooked big choruses. Mm-hmm without being pandering it's really intelligently written songs Mm -hmm. so my opinion sure yeah do you feel do you feel like you could only do that at this point if if that allowed financially oh yeah yeah i would love that that would be wonderful well i hope that Um, happens i hope that happens me too (laughs) yeah it's it's trucking along you know the fan base gets bigger and we're, it's been, it's been fun. The last, it, it was really strange to, you know, that, that hold on to yourself EP we did. It was the first thing that Kurt mixed of ours up in Salem. And uh, it was kind of our first release with the current sound we have. It, we just kind of naturally moved from what we started as into this grungy, uh, like sludgy hard rock thing. And, uh, that stuff's all done great. We haven't really been able to like go out on the road and celebrate it proper all the way yet, but like all the releases we put out in pandemic did really well. Right. Okay. Which was strange. It was really weird. We, we, we put the first song out in February and then everything changed. So, oh, right. Okay. But people need shit to listen to then too. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. It, it was weird. It was like, do we, cancel release do we pull it back it's too late we just go see what happens it's confusing yeah Yeah. um i feel like i could go like three different directions with asking you questions about (laughs) you know what i mean like (laughs) um do you yeah i don't know fuck um With, I mean, would you would you want to do like a modern country tour or anything like that? I don't want to put you on the spot. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I'm not trying to like. You know what I mean? I'm just like no. like it's a diverse career, and I understand that. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like I, I I have turned them down. Yeah, that's a no. Okay. I I wouldn't uh, in this moment in my life anyway. I wouldn't tour with with somebody. Um. 
unless it was like incredible life changing money. Right. Um, and I mean that, uh, I just don't want to do something I'm not really like equally a part of anymore. Yeah. But, but you know, I have the privilege of having the in town thing that makes right. that possible. Right. So, all right. So you're, re- but you're recording. Oh, you just went to Salem and recorded. Yeah. Those are commanders. Um, and, but I'm assuming during the pandemic, you were recording that stuff at home. Yeah. So we did, um, we put out three things. We put out Hold On To Yourself, which we recorded pre-pandemic, but then we put out two different singles, which were four songs total. We okay. recorded them at home. Yep. Did you did you record it all and mix it all? Uh, no. Well, Kurt mixed everything. Okay. Um, but yeah, we recorded it all here. Drums at the house, drums, vocals, and bass at the house. And okay. we had to go to a studio to do guitars. Okay. What, two- what's your what's your philosophy behind recording that stuff at home? Oh man. Well, I actually do a lot of takes at the house and I have to, I, I maybe have a problem and need to like, let go. Like it, it's funny when somebody else is recording, I can't let go, but I definitely worked really hard to get what I was most happy with. Um, try to get full performances. Don't edit anything together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to break it apart. Was that execution of parts or you, or like energy or just knowing the tunes well enough where it flowed, you know, it was, it was feel execution and tempo, mm-hmm. um, which is weird for us. Like, you know, uh, I think the enemy I know is an interesting example in that I think the chorus drops about three to four BPM every time it gets there. Okay. And it's right back in the verse, which isn't something I meant to do. I wasn't like trying to do that, but when it happened, for some reason, I knew that meant it was right. Okay. And I think if you listen to it, it makes sense. Okay. But yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. So it was kind of perfecting the the kind of feel change. Yeah. For every time that came around, to just just land it in the right spot. I, I feel like when I I know when something feels right, and when I get there, that's it. Yeah. It has sort of a magic. Um, chugging along where it's like, I can't stop if I want. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like caught in the middle of it. Yeah. And then just recording wise, like sonically, what, like, um, I mean, what did you, what were you going for and what, what did you feel like you could achieve for what you wanted at home? Well, you know, luckily we have like a cathedral shaped ceiling in the room we use here and it's sort of a shotgun room. It's like, Uh the width of the house but narrow yeah so it's not a huge room sound but it's enough to really get like a a good enough tail on the snare drum for it to achieve like a rock sound so uh i play really big drums as you brought up uh, yeah <laughs> 15 inch rack toms yeah yeah so <laughs> you know good transients and like a good rumble to everything mm-hmm. um but like mid-rangey natural sounding mm-hmm. uh i don't want it to be too too dead or okay or dry right open yeah. open and aggressive but not like ugly yeah and i mean honestly i'm hitting so hard in the band and the guitar sounds are so massive like if if um anything's dead it just disappears you right. don't hear any of the overtones in the final product right so they're there yep yeah that's always an interesting thing to learn you're like no that's okay because yeah, and guitars are going to swallow that shit up, and if I don't, it's it my sound becomes like a size of a pea. Yeah, I mean, I always tune the snare to like the key of the song, and it's okay. a big, loud, wide open ring. You hear none of it until like the last hit of the song. Sometimes, right? right. <laughs> you do that in 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 like every session. Uh, any session where there is ring happening, which is not many anymore. Right. Right. But, right. Yeah. The right. vibe in town is a lot of compression, and a lot of going down the tape with all that stuff. So you're just trying to keep keep stuff from being noisy and annoying. Right. Um, how about like like miking and learning that stuff? Do you feel like you just were around that enough, you know, growing up and, and just working that like you, you kind of understand it inherently? Yeah, I was lucky enough to like see and steal everything from some of the best. Right. Just copy your, do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite like... M- I fucking hate this question. I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you have like a favorite mic or like a position for friendship commanders in particular that you feel like, Oh, that's the thing. That's the thing that like kind of captures the sound the best or. 
I think the greatest drum mic ever invented is the Josephson E22. And uh, yeah, I've got those here. My prized possessions on Tom's. It's okay. just whenever I hear them, they're perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, I get it if you're not using them for for everything because they are so like well rounded and bright and clear sounding. But mm -hmm. that kind of changed everything. Getting those. Also, uh, I really love the SERN17s for overheads. Like, oh yeah, okay. As far as really great usable like small diaphragms go, yeah. It's hard to get away from them uh, in my untreated room. Okay, so it's the the room is kind of bonkers. Yeah, it's just it's drywall, wood floor. Okay, we haven't treated it. Um, still a millennial, so have a <laughs> have a fifties ranch house that isn't really big enough to like do any permanent changes to. Right. It's just kind of there. We can't really modify it permanently to be a recording studio space. Is it? It's a bedroom with no, a taller ceiling. It used to be a garage. We think. Okay. Uh, Buick actually uh, bought this house uh, before we met, and it was that room is part of why she bought it because it was a good, open, airy music room. Okay. But uh, yeah, we think it was converted from a, a garage or built onto the house at some point. Okay, but the floors must make a nice difference if they're wood. Yeah. Yeah, it was carpet initially. We actually changed that. If you listen to our first record, Dave, or like our EP Garfield, okay. it's the same room, but it sounds wildly different. Really um, different. Is it like a two-car garage, kind of like 15 by 15, 17 by 17-ish? Uh, it, it's it's only wide enough for one car, but you could fit two cars lengthwise in it. I oh, think. oh, so it's long? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. You're like one and a half. That might be... But it's not, yeah, half, half a Prius. It's long. It's longer than it is wide, so the reflections aren't bad. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Huh. That's cool. I've got, my setup is uh, since I figured you might ask at some point anyway. But yeah. Yeah, can, yeah. That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Snare, uh, snare drums, fifty-seven top for uh, ND four six eight bottom, uh, D twelve low freak on the kick drum. Uh, Josephson's RN17s, uh, the Barry M160 Hat and Ride, and I got an R88 about six feet away from the drums for rooms. Okay. And uh, so yeah, and you could still you could get the the mic about fifteen feet away, I think, if you wanted the room mic. Okay. That's cool. I, I'm sure the room sounds great. I'm, I, I'm, that's the, the long room is really interesting to me. Yeah. 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 And just like, you just got a carpet, you just set the drums on the carpet and. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It works. Uh, you know, we, I think we want to build out or like get an addition or probably move to a bigger house and see at some point, but. Right. It, it's worked really well considering. So, okay, so you d you're not doing much other stuff out there, but are you changing drums out or anything like that for, like, other shit, like, often? Or, like, how do you, how do you approach that? Or you just try to keep your... I Man, I, I tend to just keep the the one kit there, and I modify it as I go. Like, I'll open the kick drum up. I've got a... It's just a 1983 Tama Superstar. Oh, fuck yeah, dude. Yeah. What color? Uh, The mahogany. Super mahogany. Oh, yeah, the mahogany. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 24. I put the 15 and 18 up for yeah. For C, but it's 14, 16 most of the time. Okay. Yeah. That's still big. The 14. Yeah. <laughs> so you have, wait, do you have a whole, so you have 14, 15, 16, 18, 24. So in the super mahogany, I actually have a 10, 12, 13, 14, two 16s and an 18, a 22 and a 24, uh, 20, the 22, 13, 16 extras that I have are in Carnage. That's the kit I'm playing on most stuff. Okay. Oh, wow. Did yeah. you buy that at one time or did, was that like an early kit or what was, what's the story? I got into them a few years ago. Okay. Uh, right as the prices were starting to go up. Was that the Simon Phillips? Was that a Simon Phillips thing? The mahogany? It may, it may have been. But he was a superstar guy? Yeah. Yeah, I think so, right? Yeah, and they're—I mean—they're Burt's drums. They just the colors mahogany. The mahogany is what they call it. No shit. Yeah, the 
the super maple and super mahogany are just finishes. They're all birch. Really? Yeah, they're like um they're like recording customs, like Thomas version. Interesting. Because I think like the swing stars is which I, I had are like fiberglass or something. <laughs> yeah, uh the swing stars were were mahogany. And they really? were nine ply, but they had that Zola coat. Yeah, that weird coat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you went deep on this. I love it. Oh, yeah, the Imperial Stars and the Swing Stars are mahogany. They're the same exact shells with different hardware. Wow, that's interesting to know. Because I, I would actually love to have a Swing Star kit again, just because my recollection is they sounded great. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, they made a Swing Star with the Van Halen stripe design. Oh, yeah? So, yeah, they made one that was black and white, one that was red and white, like the guitar. I think there's one for sale out in California for like $400. I better get it before this. I put this out in yeah, public. They're pa- power tom sizes. An OG though. Yeah, yeah, the power toms. Yeah, the fucking like. Yeah. yeah, that's what I had. I had the black. Uh, no, sorry, the dark cherry. And it, yeah, it must have been thirteen, fourteen, sixteen. It must have been. Yeah. Yeah. I, I play Imperial Stars live. Okay. Let's see. So I got a black kit. I had that. Uh, they called it platina. That like metallic, white silver color. Yes. And I had that for a while. Um, but yeah, you know, that's like Stan Lynch played an Imperial star on everything. I think that was, uh, didn't, didn't Stuart Copeland play an Imperial star too. Yeah, but it's actually, he played an Imperial star live. I think he may have played superstar in the studio. Okay. That's 50, 50. I'm not sure. I've heard differing reports. I know Terry Chambers was an Imperial star guy. Oh, fucking. Oh man. Uh, you remember Luke Adams? He told me that Terry Chambers is coming through here soon. I guess he's doing like an XT, his own XTC thing. Awesome! That's I gotta great. try to go. I would love to see him play live, man. I hope he's in good shape. I, I bet he is. I know. Like, what a beast! You're you're a Terry Chambers fan. I mean, not many people know the, if you just throw out Terry Chambers who the fuck he is, right? Right. I mean, it, it, XTC lost a lot without him. I still love him post Terry, but. Uh, right. It, it went a different direction, but yes. I mean, the his fucking tour de force behind those tunes, those early tunes is like. Yeah, and I relate because it doesn't really sound like he was ever thinking much about what he was doing. It was like, this is a part, you know, like that was just what he heard and he did it. And it's where they were kind of weird, kooky parts that really made sense to him and made the songs perfect. And yeah, I just, uh, it, that would be interesting to know, especially because, um, uh, drawing a blank, uh, songwriter, uh, Andy Partridge, Andy, yeah, you know, it's you got to wonder if he was very specific and had those ideas, or 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 if it was really Terry doing those, you know, just doing it. But it was so different after him; you'd have to wonder. Like it became very. It became very like proper and clean after Terry in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. Yeah. They may have actually disliked what Terry was doing. <laughs> I mean, that's, I think, I, I think there definitely could have been personality issues on like, don't fucking tell me what to play kind of thing, you know? Dude, like big drum sounds, playing rock songs. Yeah. It was super solid. I don't know how hard he hit, but he sounds like a hard hitter. Right. I have, I have searched YouTube videos for him and I just, not enough, so I'm just not really recalling, but, you know. I, he, he, you know, like, there's that Rock Palace concert. There's a concert, too, I think, of uh, them in Scotland, and he looks very much like a British rocker, that that era. Yeah. Uh, much more so than the other guys. Um, But, man, what a unique voice. Like, what a total badass, like, like kind of solid bonhomie, but way more quirky and... Like, I don't know where he was coming from, you know. Right. Well, and with English settlements, kind of one of the one of the first of that kind of drum sound. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if he's coming through Nashville, actually. I don't know if there's an XTC market. I don't know where there's an XTC market anywhere, but. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of fish musicians worship that band here, so. Yeah. As they should. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Um, fuck, dude. What else? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're like, wait, you called me. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I love that you 
are fucking in love to Terry Chambers, man. That's like, yeah. What's funny though is if I did an XTC tribute, I'd want to play bass. Are you good enough bass player to do that? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Oh shit. I've got I've got a number one under my belt as bassist. I just play the root note though. So. Have you been doing that since you were a kid? No, oh, man, that's that's a, a later on thing. But you know, my dad's a bass player, so right, always around. It was kind of the some osmosis there. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Do you practice bass now? Uh, I don't practice anything, but I probably should. Okay, uh, I, I take that back. I've been actually practicing again um, to try and be a better drummer. It sucks. You're practicing what? To try and be a better drummer. It sucks. What are you doing? Mostly double pedal stuff. Okay. I'm, I'm real slow. It's uh, not fun. And, you know, that's like the worst. It's like the Humilitron in a rehearsal space. It's like a solo vocal. You're just doing eight notes on your left foot unevenly, and the entire building can hear it. And you're like, don't listen to me. <laughs> so, so your early metal thing was not focusing on double kick? I was much faster at one point. Okay. But it went away. I also just wonder, like becoming six foot six with really long legs, it seems like gravity's really not in my favor anymore. Right. The stuff you, wasn't stuff wasn't that fast when I was young, either. Yeah, I mean, do you, uh, that, well, do you want to be Dave Lombardo fast? Is that what you're talking about? It'd be awesome. That's not a goal of mine. All right. Okay. Um. You know, just like old school thrash, like I mean, like Megadeth thrash. Yeah. Not Dave Lombardo thrash. Okay, that'd be fun. I mean, I, I I actually I don't know when it was. I feel like in the last two years I put up my double pedal. Just I don't know why. I think there must have been a reason. And I just started doing it, and man, it helped my my posture, my balance so much. Yeah, you know that's that's the big thing. When I started, it's been a long time since I actually just focused on my left leg, mm -hmm. and when I noticed how like basically dead it was, for lack of a better word. Mm. like it would start to tingle and feel strange after about a half hour of doing it. And I'm like, I use my right leg all day, every day and don't feel that that's bad. Mm. I can't be good. Mm. So yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like as I've been doing it, I've noticed I'm a little com more comfortable on a stool. Mm -hmm. It's less of a thing to like switch from the hi hat or do anything like that. It's, it, you know, it's funny how that stuff all like adds up. It has to contribute to core strength in right. a way. Right. Are, are you are you putting that into tunes yet, or are uh, you, or have you? We get a lot of mid tempo stuff uh, on the double pedal side. I don't really ever see it going too fast in FC, but um, uh, I'm always scared that Buick will just show up one day with something that requires more of me than I'm capable of. Because <laughs> she doesn't really write with rules, and it's just whatever's there at the time. And okay, it could go that way. Well, you'll rise to the challenge. I have no doubt. We weren't, there was no double pedal in FC until she showed up with the riff for women in the front one day. And I was like, sounds like that was inadvertently written with double pedal of mine. And she says, yeah, it'd be cool. So ever since it's been that. You know what I think is harder than fast double bass is slow double bass. Yeah. Really slow. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of space in there. Like slow and even. That is a. <laughs> tough call i played i played in a band out here in, in the in the mid 90s when i first moved here and it was a lot of that you know dun, 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 like you know guitar kick and bass locked it's it's right on the edge where you you it's just too fast for one foot yeah but right you're, you right know. you want the power but you don't yeah. want to fall to the left at the same time you know <laughs> It's such a weird thing too, man. And it takes like two weeks to completely go away. If you like let it go, it's gone. I heard that Luke Bryan is looking for some double kick in his next record too. So, I don't, you know. Well, man, I think, you know, we've really been bringing it to Nashville. <laughs> Span the horizons of country music. Called Jerry Rowe. He's, he's got the new, he's got yeah. the new thing. Nothing says country like double pedal. Hey, man. Nothing says country like trap hats. That's true. And tents on guitar. Right? All, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Could be the thing, dude. Maybe. You, you may be way ahead and you just, you're so far ahead that it's not even a thing. <laughs> I got to slow down. <laughs> yeah.
Get back. <laughs> Could Sorry. Be. Yeah. No, I like the CD shelf, by the way. Those are CDs, right? Oh, no, those are Blu-rays. Oh, well, f- even even cooler. Uh, yeah, I got Whoa. Some, some like 2000 somewhere. Do you have um spare Blu-ray players in the, in a in a in a box in case? <laughs> I, do have, I do have a spare. Um, <laughs> oh wait, I got more over there too. I forgot. Those are so it's separated. These are American films. Ah, uh, that is over in this bookshelf is uh, Japanese, Chinese, HK, Vietnamese, Korean films. Okay. okay. Um, which actually I'm a bigger fan of in general. Okay. My favorite area of cinema. So. I make all our music videos. I'm a I'm a nut for this stuff. Are, are those things that you watch regularly still? Like, are, do you go through there and go, oh, I want to see this again? Yeah, well, I collect them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'll get on tears and watch like a certain genre or like a certain actor, a certain director. Okay. Just go through. The, the nerdiest thing is this is, uh, it's all arranged by year. So. Do you have yeah. a Rick, do you ever rearrange them? Like, what's that? F- What's that book? Uh, What's that book about the record store geeks? It was like late 90s, early 2000s. And the guy, anytime he was going through a personal crisis, he was rearranging his albums by color or song title or... I like to to stick to year, and I don't know why, but yeah, it's year alphabetical. Okay. uh, The oldest one I have is... Destry Rides Again. I think. When's that from? It's probably 1938. Okay. So what happens when like there's no more Blu-ray players that work? What do you what are you doing with all that? I mean, can you find them anyway, like online or whatever? Yeah, and it's still a very it's it's quite a bit more alive than most people think. Okay. There are like new labels popping up all the time, lots of like independent stuff coming out. Okay. So so that's like a tour hunt for you? All the time? Uh, no, you generally have to mail order this stuff at this point. Ah, okay. Even even overseas, or like, yeah. yeah, major cities will have a good store somewhere. But okay, are you guys gonna uh, friendship commanders? Are you guys gonna tour the east at all? Is there a market in Japan or 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 like? We'd love to. Uh, yeah, we'd love to. I think that's kind of a, a plan with this this next record, especially UK Europe. But. Uh, yeah, I've always wanted to go to Japan. I've never been to Japan. Oh man, you gotta go. Yeah. You've heard that a thousand times, right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, everyone who's been there is like, oh, it's incredible. Yeah, because it yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Right on. Well, thanks, dude. Thank you. I hope this uh was sensical of some sort. I mean, yeah, it's like with everybody I talk to, it always goes like a different place, you know what I mean? And like yeah. It's just interesting to hear people's takes um, on just what they're fucking doing with their career, you know. And the the studio thing is so f- finicky for well, like you know, for like ninety percent of guys that do studio work. And I think it's unusual, you know. You're I think that you're one of the few people that that works as much as you do in in the, you know what I mean, and. Um, it's just interesting. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah, five percent at home. Whereas, like, most drummers are like ninety five percent of. Like for me, it's like eighty percent of my work is at home out here. Yeah. Well, you know, did you find that um, when things started opening back up, that you were doing more in person work in the studio than before? I am. In fact, I'm leaving like in forty five minutes, and I'm working all week in a studio. You know. So I'll say this: what um. I, th- I think there was always sort of the the thought that home recording was going to take over eventually. You know, like people like nobody wants to run a studio anymore. Album budgets are getting smaller, but uh, it became pretty apparent very quickly how much more expensive and how much more of a time suck recording at home is because you're paying everybody their separate rate, um, and you're wrangling all that and keeping it together. Especially if it ends up being on the card, mm-hmm. uh, which everything is here still. It's not here, but yes, yeah. But, but even then, it's still like you know solo session rate. And I think people are charging more out there than they are here for home rate. And so everything just adds up and it ends up costing more and you end up getting less 
in a longer amount of time. Whereas you can, you know, book two, three hour slots, leave with four songs basically done. Mm -hmm. And you've had more control over the final product in the process with either producer or the artist there or whatever ends up happening. Right. Because the decision making that happens in, in Homeland is way slower. Things that would be literally decided in five seconds take 20 minutes. And I mean, the tones aren't exactly what you're looking for. Like they're more, they're more like, you know, catered to the, the person's personal taste with direction going as far as they're able to go. But, and you know, just you're recording yourself, which is some version of nerve wracking all the time, no matter what. And then you miss stuff that's messed up or, right. uh, but yeah, the, the input on the floor, especially if you're tracking live. When I remember the last session I did before the shutdown, it was really emotional. Everybody was like, this is all going to be gone, but it really wasn't. Right. Oh yeah. There was a sense of like, Oh, this is, this is going to be the nail in the coffin. Yeah. I mean, who, who thought that the music business would end up doing so well on the recorded side of things. He really did. I mean, which sucks for us, for people touring live because it's not that experience, but right. Everything went up for labels. So you feel like it's, it's a little more on fire now that, I mean, you, like you said, you didn't really shut down long, but you feel like now it's like on hyper on hyperdrive. Yeah, and I just think in general, out there in in New York and cities where the studio situation hasn't stayed such a bedrock of the cultural situation, um, I think people have realized how much better it can be, how yeah. valuable it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I yeah, like I am, like this year, I have been out tracking live more than I have been in a long time. And man, knock on wood, that's... Yeah. That's... The, yeah. the thing now you know people- I, and I, I do think partially it's music's going back more to a live musician mm-hmm. sound mm-hmm. than it has than it has been in a while yeah but, yeah but yeah i mean it's been it's been interesting the the uh there you know all of the players in the like core group have all had a nuts couple of years here this with it just national being what it is mm-hmm. and it being such a like high streaming genre country music yeah um yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's why I got into into doing it, so I'm happy. You know, we all want to play with other people if we yeah. can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. There's nothing better than going home at the end of the day and having been creative with other people in the room and collaborative, and and hopefully walk away with something that you think is really good. Whether yeah. whether whether you're going to go home and listen to it or not, you still have a sense of like I I created something like super, like right good. It, to- it's- as useful as tracking at home is, it's, uh, I don't know how healthy it is to. There's not a similar feeling at the end of the work. I mean, actually, sometimes there is. I did something yesterday. It was actually with another drummer when I was engineering. But at the end of it, it was like, oh, that was fun. It was creative. But often it's just like, okay, cool. I got my work done for today. I made some money. Yeah, there's the geeking out and obsessing over a certain sound for your own project and like working till three in the morning. That's really fun and rewarding. Right. Um, but, at, you know, at the same time, like, especially with if you do have any sort of workload outside of the house to then come home and have more to do, it's not good for your mental state. Yeah, that seems like more of a. Then it feels like work because you're already tired and, and the and the yeah. thing of doing it alone is not as fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it's strange too. like I end up always having to do more takes. I hate when I'm playing more. <laughs> like, ah. Right. Right. Well, yeah, there's that weird. I think, and I think, especially in Nashville, at least from what I understand, I mean, there's the, you know, you guys are in the the union blocks. Yeah. Shit's going to get done faster. Whereas here, you know, I try to keep myself like mentally like, okay, I'm going to do this in X amount of time or takes or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. until it's right. But, you know, it's the rules are much easy, more easily broken. Your preset rules. Yeah. Just, yeah. I can talk for another hour about all of this. I know, I know. It's like <laughs> breaking another, th- breaking another thing. All right, I got to run though. I'm, uh, I got to be somewhere at one. But I appreciate you, dude. I appreciate you running around this morning and getting back to yeah, me. I wish for you to have a great session today. Thank you. I'm getting if sounds you- today. It's one of those things. I get to get sounds today and then go back to the rest of the week. Dude, I've never done that. A sound day. Yeah, it's like the '80s. Yeah, I get a sound half hour. <laughs> yeah. This is like a this is like a Bonamy thing. It sounds like it's going to be f- super fun. It's it's like rock Bonamy female singer. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, man.
All right, dude. Yeah. Have a great yeah. day. Yeah, you too. Good to see you. Talk soon. Yes.